Memory management is a very important aspect of software development. Every program that's running is interacting with the computer memory somehow. And on this video, we're going to talk a little bit about that and give a brief introduction to how memory management works, um, how manual and automated memory management strategies differ, and where garbage collection comes in. If you went to university, you're probably well versed into manual and automated memory management, garbage collection, etc. However, if you're self-taught like me, and uh, if you spend most of your time in higher level languages like PHP, Python, Ruby, uh, you're probably not as familiar, especially because those languages take care of memory management for you. If you're writing Ruby, you don't really have to worry about requesting memory from the operating system and releasing, etc. So first, let's talk about how memory allocation works. There are two ways you can allocate memory. The first one is what we call stack allocation. Stack allocation is related to stack frames. We're not going to cover that in this video, but basically when you have a function, for example, you have a stack frame associated to the function execution, which includes it, the name, the arguments it takes, the variables that are associated with the function, and that goes into the stack memory. The stack memory is automatically cleared once the function ends, for example, so you don't have to worry as much about it. If you declare a variable, for example, if you declare an integer that goes into the stack. The other way you can allocate memory is in the heap. And heap allocation is a little bit different. So let's say that you have a web application that's running PHP, for example, and you want to interact with the request payload. The request payload has to be stored somewhere in the memory, and you're not exactly sure how big it is going to be. Maybe you have a call where the user's name has four characters, and maybe you have a different request where it has eight characters, and maybe you have another request where it has a bunch of data. So it's variable, it's dynamic. And in those situations, you have to allocate memory dynamically. There are also other differences between the stack and the heap, but in, in short, the stack has a shorter life cycle, that is the duration of the execution of the function and it has a limited size. So that's why we have things like stack overflow. Now, when we're talking about the heap, again, if you have dynamic memory allocation, you have to request some memory to the operating system. So basically say, hey man, I need this many bytes. Can you give it to me? And the operating system is going to respond with a pointer to a block of memory. If you've ever used C, you're probably familiar with malloc, which means memory allocation. And that's a way you can request some memory to the operating system. So when you receive that request in PHP, what PHP is doing behind the scenes is requesting some memory to the operating system so that it can store the request data. Now, one of the big differences is when you're dealing with the heap, you have to request data, but you also have to give that memory space back to the operating system. Otherwise, you're going to end up with something we call a memory leak. You're probably familiar with that term. A memory leak occurs when you request some memory and you do not give that back. What happens is if I request some memory to the operating system, it is going to allocate me some memory and it is going to reserve that memory space to the program. So other programs cannot access it. It is blocked. It might not be full, but it's blocked. It is allocated to the program that requested it. So if I have one gigabyte of memory and I request 500 megabytes, now the operating system only has 500 megabytes to give to every other program. Here's an example. Let's say that you have a program and you request one megabyte. Well, one megabyte is not a lot nowadays, so it's not going to cause a problem, even if you don't free that up. But what if you have the browning in a loop and you request that one megabyte many times? Well, that one megabyte is going to eventually turn into 100 megabytes, then in one gigabyte, and then at some point you're going to overflow the memory and you're going, either the program is going to crash because you ran out of memory or the operating system, the, the system itself is going to crash. That's why it's important for us to free that memory if we're dealing with manual memory allocation. You ask for some memory, you use that, and then you give it back. Let's take a look at a simple C program to see how memory reacts and what happens when you have a memory leak. All right, let's take a look at this very simple C program. We basically have a target allocation size, and then while we still haven't reached the total allocation size, we just keep requesting memory from the operating system until we reach that. At the end, we have get char so that we wait for user input. That is, until I type something, the memory is going to stay allocated. And once I type something, it is going to execute this loop. And then memory is going to be freed. We're calling free right here. So 
What's important here is we're calling malloc here to allocate memory. So we are requesting memory from the operating system. And here we are giving that memory back to the operating system. I have compiled that already, so I am going to run it. There we go. And I have htop running here, so let's search for it. Where is that? Okay, there we go. So you can see it is using almost two gigs of RAM. Now, if I go here and I finish the, pro the, the process, well, the process is finished, so it's not consuming any memory anymore. But you can see that until the free calls ran, it was using that memory. The memory was allocated to the program. If we go back here and uh, let's make a small change. Let's deallocate the memory just after requesting it. So we can say free and we have mem. Okay, there we go. And now we can uh, get rid of this. So let's compile this. Let's execute it. And let's go back to, there we go. So as you can see, it's only using about 50 bytes of memory. I'm sorry, 50 kilobytes of memory, whereas it was previously using almost two gigs. And that's because we are freeing up the memory after each iteration of the lip. So at the end of the day, we're not really consuming a whole lot of memory. We ask for a little bit and we almost immediately give it back to the operating system. So at some point, some very smart folks said, hey, what if we didn't have to deal with manual memory allocation? What if we had automatic memory allocation? And that's what languages such as Ruby, Python, PHP, etc. It's what they all use. You don't have to worry about allocating or deallocating memory. The language does that for you. Now, the problem is if you're manually dealing with memory management, you know when you want to deallocate that and you can safely do that or well, and safely, sometimes you can get the problems we mentioned. But the point is you explicitly give that memory back to the operating system. How does it work if you're not doing that? Basically, every time that you create a variable in PHP and let's say you create an array or you create an object, that's going to be allocated into the heap. PHP behind the scenes is going to ask the operating system for that memory. And PHP is going to keep an eye to everything that's happening in your program. And as soon as you're no longer using the value, that is when PHP understands that that value can be safely returned to the operating system, that memory can be safely returned, it is going to do that. And that's what we call garbage collection. So every time that we have garbage, that is, regions of memory that are no longer being used by the program, an algorithm is going to go there and give that memory back to the operating system. On this video, we're going to talk about two strategies. The first one is called reference counting, and it's what PHP primarily uses. And the second one is called mark and sweep, which is a more complex algorithm. Most languages will use a mix of different strategies, but those are the most common ones and what we're going to focus on. Reference counting is extremely simple. Let's say that you create a variable in PHP. What happens behind the scene is yes, that value is created, but a counter is attached to the value. So when you instantiate an object, you're creating a variable in the stack, which points to a region of memory in the heap. And that value includes a counter. Every value starts with a counter of one. So if you create a new object, you have the counter of one. If you reference that new object at some other place, the counter goes up. So every time the object is referenced, and I'm not saying object in the literal sense of object in object oriented programming, I'm talking about a value. The counter goes up and every time it is dereferenced, it goes down. What it does is extremely simple. It can go up indefinitely, but every time that it reaches zero, it deallocates a memory. It gives it back to the operating system. So if you have an object being instantiated with a ref count of one and you pass that to another function, you get a ref count of two. When the function ends, the object is being dereferenced. So the ref count is now back to one. And once the main function ends, the ref count goes to zero. So that memory is given back to the operating system. Now, if you have global variables, the ref count is never going to be zero and therefore that memory is never going to be given back to the operating system. The same happens with constants or classes, static properties. They all exist all the time, so the ref count is never going to be zero. One caveat that you have though is, let's say that you have two objects, and uh, so you have object A and object B, and object A references object B, object B references object A. So you have a circular reference. 
Even if those objects are no longer reachable in code, the ref count is never going to be zero because they reference each other. So they're always going to have a ref count of at least one. And therefore, they're never going to be given back to the operating system. So for those particular scenarios, PHP specifically employs a different strategy. It has a garbage collector that's focused in dealing with those situations, but mostly it uses reference counting. Let's take a look at reference counting in real life using a PHP script to see how that works. All right, now let's take a look at a very simple PHP script. We have a class foo and we have a function boo. All that function does is instantiate the class, assign a value to a property and return it. So what happens here is when we instantiate this, it gets a ref count of one. When it goes out of scope, it gets a ref count of zero. So, well, not really here, but uh, I would say here. As the function ends, this gets a ref count of zero, and then it's given back to the operating system. That is, if I don't do anything with the function, if I do this, this is what happens. However, if I assign this bool to a variable like this, then the ref count is going to be one here. And this is never going to be given back to the operating system, especially because this is a global. There's actually a way we can see this uh, using Axe Debug. So let's do the following. Let's keep this. And I have Axe Debug running. I'm going to call Axe Debug Debug Zval and pass the name of the, the variable called full like this. And then uh, we're going to call the function. Let's run this. And as you can see, there we go. So we have full, we have a ref count of one. And then we have the class that's related to the value, to the variable, to the symbol, that is. This is called a symbol, and this is the value. All right, cool. What if I assign a variable to it? So let's say variable, it's going to be boo, and let's copy this. Whoops, that's not what I meant to do. And let's put it here. Let's rerun this. Whoops. There we go. So foo no set symbol, and that's because it is now called variable. So there we go, ref count is still one. What if I assign uh, another value to it like this? Ref count is now two. What if I assign a third value? Ref count is now three. So basically, unless we clear out all of those references, this is never going to be deallocated. Let's try something else. Okay, so we know that we have three references, right? Let's rerun this. What if we say that B is now no? Let's see what happens. It's called variable, there we go. Well, now it's decreased to two. What if we say that A is now? Okay, now we got one. So we had a ref count of one. It's this call right here. Then we had a ref count of three. It's this call right here. And then a ref count of one. What if we say that variable is no? Let's run this. And then the ref count is zero. So it's been deallocated and the memory was given back to the operating system. The second strategy is called mark and sweep. And this is a more complex algorithm. It works in two steps. The first one is the mark phase. And the second one, as you've guessed, because you're very smart, is the sweep phase. The goal of the algorithm is to trace everything that should not be cleaned. So it starts with the assumption that everything's dirty, everything on the hip is dirty. And then it creates what we call the root set. The root set is composed of the objects that are accessible in the execution context. That is variables that exist within the function, global variables, class constants, etc. Everything that's in the stack. Now, from those root objects, it starts to trace all references. So, what objects do those root objects reference? And it starts to build an object graph. Once it has the graph, it knows that everything that's being referenced should stay in memory because it is currently being used and it finishes the first phase, which is marking. So it marks every object that was reachable, that was referenceable. The ones that were not referenceable, that is the objects that cannot be reached from the root set, did not get marked. Once the objects are marked, it can start the sweep phase. And the sweep phase is very simple. It goes through all of the objects on the heap and it deallocates every object that is not marked. That is every object that could not be referenced. So mark and sweep is straightforward, but it is relatively slow. One major difference that you're going to have between mark and sweep and reference counting, for example, is that reference counting runs every time that a reference counter reaches zero. 
So every time that something is referenced and they, they're no longer being referenced anywhere in the program, the memory space is going to be given back. With mark and sweep though, you, the algorithm needs to run at certain moments to do the mark and the sweep phases, and that takes a while and that also stops the program. The program execution must stop for a little while so that the algorithm runs, and after it finishes, the program is resumed. So it has a very different life cycle. It doesn't run all the time. It runs every now and then, but the program must stop. Now, some very smart people were also aware of these problems and they worked in improving those algorithms, creating new garbage collection techniques such as generation garbage collection and some other things. So this is also taken care of. You don't have to worry about that. But that's kind of the gist of it. As I said, this was a very introductory video. I hope this helped you somehow. If you have any suggestions, any critiques, uh, if I said anything that's wrong, leave that in the comment box. And uh, I'll see you guys on the next video. Bye-bye.